Is man destined to become obsolete? Can he easily be replaced by the super-efficient machine, the computer? Written by DC Fontana, the ultimate computer explores the complex relationship between man and machine. Although we initially embrace our new inventions, we secretly live in fear of them taking over. But exactly how much faith do we put in a computer? Will the computer equivalent of the steam drill replace Kirk the way it did John Henry? Well, we all know the answer to that one. Unlike John Henry, James T. Kirk will not die with his hammer in his hand. Let the battle between Kirk and the ultimate computer begin. I've been particularly touched by um, Asian American men who come up to me and tell me that when they were growing up in uh, northern Florida or in New Jersey or in Minnesota that they were the only Asian boy in their community, in their class uh, and the image that they usually saw of Asians on television and movies were pretty unattractive ones. I was the only one that gave them a sense of pride, a, a, a sense of wanting to connect with uh, uh, someone on the media. And whenever there was uh, game playing, they got to be Sulu. And they now here they are as young junior executives uh, or uh, young professionals, and they would come up to me dressed in their suit and tie and tell me how important I was to their uh, early years and during their uh, formative years and for me as uh, an individual it's very gratifying that I was able to make that contribution when this thing came along it was my first crack at a, at a long-running job at a job that had uh, that uh, had potential to run longer than two weeks and I had a family and, and uh, to support and I had been working at a lot of other work to support that family outside of acting. I'd done some teaching. I also drove some taxis for a while. When I went over to see about this, I signed for seven out of 13. And I thought, ah, oh, that's seven weeks of work. Seven solid weeks of work. And then I'll go back and maybe move on to the motion picture. I was really trying to establish myself in motion pictures. But that seven weeks turned out to be the end of the line, so to speak. That was it. I didn't read for something called Uhura because she wasn't uh, cast. It wasn't cast and it wasn't written. So I read for somebody called Spock. So they were looking for somebody who would uh, draw the same kind of audience that the monkeys drew. Uh, and I, uh, I guess I fit the bill. There's a hell of a um, reason to be cast on a, uh, in a role that uh, eventually became part of my life for 30 years. And I kept asking them, well, tell me about Spock. Uh, what is she like? And they kept looking at each other, and they said, don't you know anything about the show? And I said, no, I've been in Europe for six months. And they said, well, Spock is not female. Uh, Spock is male. Also, he's not of Earth. He's... Um, from another planet and I said he's what came out he's got green blood and pointed ears I said how do I read for that agent called and he said uh, he's got an interview uh, for me I thought fantastic he said it's a science fiction project I thought mm hmm and then he said it's uh, being produced by a man named Gene Roddenberry I, I thought who is he Number three, he said, it's a pilot for a potential series. And that's when my ears perked up, because it meant, if it sells, steady employment. They let me suffer for about two more hours before they said, come on, I'll take you to lunch. Where you got the part you had when you walked in. It was great reading. When do you think the first modern computer was designed? The 1920s? The 30s? How about the 1830s? The credit goes to an English mathematician and inventor, Charles Babbage, who called his mechanical marvel an analytical engine. The first computer-like device to use electricity didn't come along until 1939, followed by UNIVAC in 1946, which was the first truly practical computer. Today, we've got the PC and the Mac, and perhaps someday we'll have a Deep Blue or a HAL. Well, 
Or maybe not a HAL. If you've seen 2001 A Space Odyssey, you know how notoriously untrustworthy they can be. The character's name was Captain Koloth in The Trouble with Tribbles. And uh, he was a, what it describes. He was the captain of the Klingons, and he was the counterpart to Captain Kirk. And of course, they knew each other. Ah, oh, my dear Captain Kirk. My dear Captain Koloff. A little aside is that Gene Roddenberry and uh, I and Mr. Kuhn had a 13 episode uh, verbal agreement that I would do Koloff in subsequent shows. We Klingons are not as luxury-minded as you Earthers. We do not equip our ships with, how shall I say it, <laughs> non-essentials. Because Mr. Roddenberry had gotten to the point where he, he, uh, he thought it was about time to have an adversary for Kirk that would be kind of running, not every show, but at 13 in the, in the course of the year. But he, uh, he dropped the show before we ever had an opportunity for that. But that was a marvelous part. I expect you to assume full responsibility for the persecution of Klingon nationals in this quadrant. It wasn't a, a long roll, but it was a very, uh, very good part. And uh, uh, I, I regret that it couldn't have gone on because I remember Gene Roddenberry saying to me and, and Gene Kuhn, how do you see yourself vis-a-vis -vis Captain Kirk? I said, well, I see him. I have a great deal of respect for him. And the strange thing is I will protect him from anybody harming him. Because if anybody's going to kill Captain Kirk, it's going to be me. <laughs> Captain Kirk, our relationship will be a peaceful one. Let us both take steps to keep it that way. Dr. Richard Daystrom learned an important lesson in humility. We create out of conceit. It's human nature to do so. We believe we can make anything better and faster, stronger, cheaper, more beautiful, more profitable, something more original. We've created computers that think and we create children that achieve. But in the end, what we create is always a mirror of our own nature and that nature as wonderful and as complex as it is is fallible so don't trust in chariots but enjoy the ride and remember always back up your hard drive we come to these interesting questions. Can man be replaced by a computer? And can the computer surpass man in capability? Or is the computer limited to the knowledge and imagination of the programmer? Certainly, in the last 40 years, we've seen the advance of the computer to a point that is essential to our everyday lives. And with every passing day, we see computers that come closer and closer to mimicking human behavior and thought processes. If there's one thing we must remember, however, it's that if man patterns his machines after himself, they reflect his weaknesses as well as his strengths, and that the ultimate threat to mankind may very well come from the ultimate computer.